Hello, welcome to the August 12th, 2022 Club Cubase live stream. I'm going to do a quick audio test and then we will begin. Hang on just one second. Hello, welcome to the August. All right, my monitoring computer sounds fine. Uh, and again, uh, my name is Greg Undo. I'll be the host for the live stream today. Uh, if you've not attended a live stream before, how it works is you can ask questions in advance by emailing to clubcubase at uh, steinberg.de or simply asking your question in the live chat field. When asking questions, if you want to indicate which level of Cubase you're running, whether it's Cubase LE, AI, Elements, Artist, or Pro, or other Steinberg programs, and which versions, such as 10, 10.5, 11, or 12, uh, that information is as, as well as which operating system you're on is helpful. Um, and my ability to answer all of the questions in real time will uh, be eclipsed, um, but I'll try my best to catch up throughout the live stream. So if you don't see an immediate response to your particular question, uh, please feel free. Um, if we could try to avoid asking the same question in the chat field repeatedly, that would be appreciated. Um, and if you, we should have all of the uh, index topics, all the topics that we covered in today's live stream indexed with timestamps uh, pinned to the top of the comments field that you could use as a reference to go back. And if you wanted to search for other uh, questions. I think we've done over 19,000 questions. Uh, you could go to cubaseindex.com and Jan from Stockholm has been kind enough to compile that website. So we give a special thanks to Jan. Uh, we also had two people that serve as moderators. So we have Agent K and Jazz Dude. So they're not Steinberg employees or Yamaha employees, but they just literally just uh, help out for the welfare and benefit of the community. So we want to give a special thanks to them. Another wonderful resource of information is going to be uh, the Cubase Nation Discord in addition to all the official Steinberg channels. And Jazzdo does a lot of work compiling that information. So uh, once again, my name is Greg Undo. I am the uh, I work as a uh, as a product specialist, primarily focusing on Steinberg products for Yamaha Corporation of America, which is the uh, distributor in the United States. And I'm presenting from outside of Washington, D.C. area in Alexandria, Virginia. Um, so if you're watching this live, please feel free to uh, introduce yourself and tell us where you're from. Um, I'm just a quick note. I'm on a brand new computer that was just kind of configured, I think, yesterday, so I may be missing a couple of components, um, but we'll try to get through the live stream. This will be my beta test to see if I have all of my uh, materials on my new computer, so but we'll go ahead and get started. Um, all right, so I see, uh, hello, uh, um, can I record directly from an external instrument channel, instrument track to an audio channel, not via the render option? The purpose is to hear the automations and send effects while recording. So this will work kind of the same way for an audio, a software instrument, or an external instrument. Is Let's say if I want it to, um, I will just come over here and let's say if I'll play a pattern, so I'll, ha I'll have a pattern selected, and I'll just turn the volume down here a bit. So let's say we, we have a pattern selected. Okay, so what we could do with any source is we could do kind of like almost an internal busing for this. So I will have Groove Agent follow the transport so what I'm gonna do is take this particular channel and select it. I'm going to right click and we will choose, uh, uh, add a group channel to selected channels. So I'm just gonna add a group and this way this track is automatically routed to that particular group. So I'll hit add track. So now when we play, uh, we will have this instrument, whether it's software, or hardware, or if it is uh, 
a you know audio track so we'll have this instrument being routed to this group and now what i'm going to do is to add an audio track let's say a stereo audio track and for its input i'm going to choose the group that we just created so now as we play i'll play and we will go ahead and so i'm going to just Instead of having to render kind of offline, what I'm going to do is now just hit record. And this audio will automatically be recorded on that particular track in real time. So if I wanted to make changes on the instrument itself, so if I wanted to come to the instrument sounds, so let's say we'll just come over here to the instrument. I wanted to change maybe the tuning on the snare. So any of the automation that we just did will be captured. So I'll just turn this off and let's listen to just the audio file uh, that we recorded. So, so you can hear the, the pitch changing on the particular, um, you know, from our snare that we just kind of automated in real time. So that would be all you'd have to do. So take the source, right click, add track, and we're gonna add a group channel to the selected track. We will come over and we'll have this group add an audio track and the audio track here, we want to set its input from the group and we can do that as we add the track and then just kind of hit record and then you should be good to go. All right, so we see, uh, is there a way to modulate a parameter of any VST through an LFO? So let me see if I have this, I may not have this part set up. Uh, so let me just see if I have on MIDI output, just gonna add a MIDI track here quickly and see, so we, I may need a, a loopback, which I may not have installed, but if I don't, I will. Okay, so I don't have a loopback installed, but if you go, um, if you're on Windows platform, on the Mac platform, you could go to the audio MIDI setup utility and activate the IAC driver. And on Windows, you could go to like a MIDI loopback. And what you want to do, and this, this is a little convoluted, I'll grant you that, but I'll just kind of open up a particular project and we'll show kind of routing what you do with the loopback. So I don't have my loopback uh, installed. I'll make a note to have that installed for Monday or Tuesday's live stream. So what we want to do is to have one MIDI track that will just kind of serve uh, as a way to kind of get the loopback information. So when we go to the MIDI inserts, what we could do is we could have an auto LFO plugin and this auto LFO plugin will generate MIDI data um, directly here. So we could say, okay, we wanted the waveform to, you know, go this way. We wanted to go straight. You know, we wanted to vary to oscillate this way or to go up and then in a ramp and restart. And we could set kind of the, uh, we could have the synchronization set the rate of the modulation set here. And what we want to do is to go into, uh, route this MIDI track out through an IAC driver. And we go to the generic remote. So we go to our studio menu to studio setup and we'll click on the plus sign and let's add a, we'll just add generic remote and for the parameter that we want to be doing, we would choose our MIDI input and output through your MIDI loopback. So on the Windows platform, I think there's loopback.be or the, you know, there's, there's MIDI loopback utilities and this is basically a way of routing MIDI data. So we want to set the loopback for your MIDI input and output ports. And what we could do is actually, you know, tell it to which parameter from the MIDI inserts that we have here. So let's say when we go to our 
uh, our MIDI inserts, when we look at the auto alpha plugin, we can say this is going to be generating on controller uh, number 10. So, but if you forgot to look at that, which is easy to do, you can come over here and just click on learn. And then as you hit play, this will automatically capture the, will enable learn, that will capture the MIDI CC message that's coming in. So we wanna capture the MIDI CC message here. And what we want to do is to say, we want it to go to like VST mixer, and then we can say, okay, on this channel, we want it to be, uh, you know, insert one, and then we could just choose a particular parameter. And then that LFO created in this MIDI track can go to any plugin on any track. And so it's going to be going through the IAC or your MIDI loopback into the generic remote. The generic remote is going to, you can learn the incoming MIDI message on the top line and what you want like this message, this top message to do in this line. So we could go to device to VST mixer. We could choose the channel from our project. And at this point choose, um, you know, our inserts and what parameter in the inserts that you want modulated. So sorry, I don't have it configured on my new computer yet. Um, my apologies. All right. Um, all right, so we have a question. Hey, is uh, Steinberg CC121 controller compatible with Cubase 12? So yes, it, it is. Uh, and it's a, a wonderful controller. So if you have the option, you know, it's, it was recently discontinued for part shortages, but if you have the opportunity to find one, most people, you know, uh, it's hard to find because most people don't sell it because they like and they like their CC121 so much. So wonderful to see Jazz Dude and wonderful to see Jan from Cubase Index. And we have Stefan checking in from Sweden. Um, all right, we have Robbie Bowling from Dallas. All right. All right, and we have Mark Rabin checking in from Denver today. All right, so Mark's in a new location today. All right, and we have Brian Sawyer checking in from Crystal Coast, North Carolina. Hope you're doing well, Brian. All right, we have John Costigan from Kenosha, Wisconsin. We have Husk from, uh, he says, greetings from a Brit in Sweden. All right, and we have Jason Sykes from South Shields, England. Great to see you on the live stream, Jason. All right, we had the artist known as Love checking in from New York. Okay, so we have a question. Uh, can you please explain the difference between warp uh, grid and warp grid musical events follow and why film scoring composers uh, use musical events follow warp mostly, free warp is new. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look. Um, so let's say I have this particular event, uh, this drum loop. Uh, and so we'll listen to this particular drum loop here. Okay, so let's say. All right, so we have uh, just kind of generic drum loop and we're gonna go to our warp grid. So let's say when we go to our warp grid and we have this loop in uh, musical mode. So when I change the tempo, we'll see that it will just stretch out to match the new tempo. So if this wasn't set to musical mode, which we could activate uh, right here from the info line, uh, as I change the tempo, the, that would, the tempo, it wouldn't automatically kind of align itself and fit to the musical grid. But again, once we activate musical mode, so let's say I will switch to uh, warp grid. So now when I come over here, we could move the measures to automatically, and as we do this, we'll see 
that these events uh, will automatically just kind of warp. So we can say measure one is this long, but measure two is this long. So we could adjust the tempo and when it's in musical mode, we can see those changes reflected. So we'll undo that and let's check, see if we can figure out what the difference is when we switch to warp grid musical uh, musical mode events follow. So as we do this, we could see that we'll see the change in kind of like the musical mode will just kind of follow the particular event. So let's say if I turn this off and we come to uh, musical events follow and I do my warping that it has no effect on the particular parameters here. Now, when we do free warp, and this was introduced on the project window and as a third mode in version 12, what this is going to allow us to do is to, we could assign different warp markers that we could drop in or we could extract from hit points. So if I wanted to change kind of the musical timing or let's say, you know, someone played, if you're a film, a film composer, let's say, you know, someone playing timpani just came in too early in an overdub or someone came in late, we could just adjust the timing based on these warp events to have that musically fit. So, all right, so let's move on. All right, and we have Marco checking in from Croatia. Thanks for joining us. All right, so we have a question uh, from Victor. Uh, we need, uh, can move and cut the freezed audio or MIDI file like in other programs. So if you wanted to do that, I mean, you know, instead of freezing, you know, one of the great options, you know, and freezing is intended to just make sure that that's gonna play back at the same time. If you wanted to do like a render, if you wanted to be able to edit the events after you freeze, you know, one of the great things to do is instead of freezing, what I would suggest is just doing a render in place and you could really kind of accomplish the same thing with a lot more flexibility. So when you go to the render settings, one, I could pick and choose which particular, uh, which particular signal options, so if I wanted to be dry or include the EQ and channel strip or effects. But now as soon as I come over here and I just render that event, I could have this event muted and then I can just choose to say, okay, I just wanted to you know, do editing on this particular event, move the event. So we could free up the resources by rendering the particular event and still have all the flexibility and we could still undo. Uh, and if we make a change here in the MIDI, we could just make all of our edits appropriately and just go back. So if you want more flexibility, you know, consider utilizing the render in place as opposed to freeze. And freeze is kind of like, I can't mess this up. You know, I don't want flexibility. I just want that to play back. Um, and at that point, if you need more flexibility, consider doing uh, the render in place instead. All right, so we have Sergey checking in from Luxembourg. And he's been a customer since version five. Thanks for being on the live stream. Okay, so we see a uh, question. Um, I, have a vol a, I have a full version of Groove Agent 5. Uh, I was download, the, lay the last version from the Steinberg Download Assistant, but why can't I use it without the e-licensor? in uh, Ableton Live, so you should be able to. So it's make sure that you're not running, uh, like, you know, if you make sure you're not running a VST2 version, that you're running a VST3 version, and that you actually have, uh, you know, that particular, you have the, it's the latest version, and that you've migrated the license. Um, so just downloading it doesn't necessarily migrate the license so once you go into your my steinberg account you'll see a voucher for your for your groove agent 5 so make sure that you do migrate the license from the uh you know you can take your uh current license i believe it'll turn it into a non-upgradable license and then you have the uh 
the latest version, which can run under Steinberg licensing, and it should run in any of the programs. But make sure that it's not necessarily just downloading it, but make sure that you've actually uh, used, utilized the license voucher and be able to um, and be able that you're make sure that you're on a new licensing system. And if you go to the Steinberg Activation Manager, you get checked to see if your Groove Agent is on the Steinberg licensing. All right, so we have a question. Uh, in an audio clip, when you do all of your curves and stuff with the pencil tool, is there any way you could copy and paste it uh, onto another clip? I don't think so, because I think it's intended for the particular clip. Um, so, you know, if we, so let's go ahead and just take a look at our, our event, our clip gains. So, you know, it's it's intended to be just for the particular event here. And if I choose to duplicate that event, you know, the clip gains will automatically be carried over with it. Um, but I don't think that there is a way, this is intended to just do this for, um, you know, for the individual clip. If you do have automation though, you can copy uh, the automation, if you wanted to open up your automation lanes and be able to, you know, copy the automation. So let's say if I'm here, uh, I could, you know, copy. And then when we come to this particular point, we could paste. So, uh, but I don't think for the clip gains are really intended for that particular clip. Uh, and so, but if you duplicate the clip, you can do that, but not it, apply that same exact uh, clip gain to another track or another uh, a separate event. All right, so we have Jan Nielsen checking in. Okay, so we see from Best Korean Jesus question, uh, is there a function or feature to have MPE revert back to the neutral zero at the end of a note? It looks like the last MPE value. Is there a workaround for this? So let's go ahead and take a quick look. Um, so I think it could really depend on, you know, what particular function that you're doing with the MPE. So some may, you know, not, uh, you know, some of the neutral may not be set to like the center value, but let's go ahead and take a look, see if we could figure it out. So I'm gonna just double click on the particular note here. Okay, so let's say we will come over to our note expression. All right, so, you know, like, so, like, when we, you know, if you have pitch, you know, it might make sense to have the pitch go to zero. So, say, if I wanted to draw in a tuning curve here. So I don't know a way to automatically take it and revert it to a particular value. Um, like a default value, but you know, each parameter you know, may not have a default value. Um, but you know, as you make the edit here, you can see the particular parameter. So let's, but I'll try, let me see if I do different modifier keys. So looks like it's gonna be uh, different um, 
So, you know, depending on the parameter. So I think it's there isn't a way to default that I know of, but I could play around with it if you want to send me an email over the weekend. Okay, so we have a question. Um, okay, uh, from uh, Rob from Tarpon Springs, Florida. Um, all right, I got a message. I can't use the free warp on an audio sample because I ramped the tempo up using the tempo track. Uh, is there a work around this? So let's go ahead and I'll just enter in some data in a tempo track here. Okay, so I'll move my tempo track down right above. So I'm gonna turn off my snap here. So let's say, okay. So I'll move this over. So let's say we're doing our tempo changes. Um, and I will now just come over here to my free warp mode. So. So as I do this, it doesn't seem to call up any messages when I do free warp. Let's see if I do like maybe something that's so extreme. So let's say we go kind of totally extreme tempo change here, and then we'll go back to our free warp tool. So I'll put in my warp marker here, but no indications will make sure that the tempo track is active. Um, so it seems to be kind of working as expected here, but let me know if I did something differently than what you did, Rob, sorry about that. Okay, we have a question. Uh, how to copy and paste only MIDI notes in event uh, without copy that event uh, and how to create macro for this? Okay, so if you wanted to do it um, you know, within a particular event, so let's say if I wanted to take a look at this, you know, we could select the events or I could select all in, in the event here and You know, or if we wanted to just select maybe just a portion of the events, uh, we'll just do it within, let's say, this particular editor. All right, so I wanted to take these notes, and I'll just hit uh, copy notes. And let's say, you know, if I wanted to come, I'll extend this event, or if I wanted to make a new event, and wherever my cursor is based, I'll be kind of the basis point for it pasting. So then we could just, you know, cut, copy, paste directly here. So, you know, just normal uh, cut, copy, paste. So if I'm here within the event, copy, I move the cursor, paste, and then you could see uh, all the events pasted there or pasted into a different event. So let me know if that makes sense. Um, so that's not copying the event, but copying selected events within an event, and you could paste that anywhere that MIDI data resides. So let me know if that helps. All right, we see Captain Energy Music from Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Thanks for being on the live stream. As well as Spike Williams from Wales. All 
All right. Uh, so we see a question um, from Rich Cole. Um, can you add feature requests for auto scroll stationary cursor? Can you make as an option to position the cursor stationary at far left or option to put stationary cursor at any place we want? Um, I'll I'll pass it along. <clears throat> I think you know, for a lot of programs, you know, this was how a lot of earlier programs kind of worked. So if you're not familiar with this feature, I'll just show it here quickly. Um, so, you know, when we, you know, so a lot of times as we scroll, we may just resize all the events here. All right, so let's say we were at a zoom level and we're playing. So usually when we get to the end, we'll see it kind of just redraw the uh, waveform. But one of the things you could do is place it into stationary cursor. And here we could just have the stationary cursor kind of in the middle. Um, but I could see where, you know, you may want the stationary cursor to be perhaps at the end, but I, I think a lot of people prefer this so that they could see what happened and what, what's going to happen in real time. This was kind of in early digital audio workstations that couldn't redraw waveforms when the computers were pretty primitive in comparison to what we have now. This is what they would do to kind of cheat to get along. Um, but I'll, I'll pass that along as a feature request. Thanks for mentioning that to, me, to us, Rich. All right, so we see a question, um, just a funny question. Uh, when you mix drums, you mix them as if you are behind the drums or as the audience. Uh, most people choose the audience, but sometimes you could tell when a drummer is mixing because uh, I've seen many drummers mix from the drummer's perspective, like where the hi-hat, if you're a right-handed drummer, is on the left-hand side of the panning spectrum and the high toms go from left to the lower toms on the right. Uh, but most people want, you know, are trying to envision the audience perspective. So, but, you know, if it sounds good, it sounds good. You know, no, no one's going to fault you for, you know, it's not right or wrong. I think most people will actually uh, just do from audience perspective. All right. We see Michael Pierce checking in from the UK. Thanks for joining us, Michael. We hope you're well. All right, so we have a question. Uh, how to map uh, standard MIDI CC uh, like expression to quick controls via MIDI remote? Uh, I want to see my automation under the clip and not in the clip. Uh, I can't see MIDI CC in the map assistant. So the mapping assistant is really intended just for um, for handling, you know, controlling what particular parameters that you want. Now, if you wanted the like MIDI CCs to show up in automation lanes, as opposed to being within like a particular MIDI event. Um, so you, if you want to see your MIDI CCs, you know, that look like standard automation. So as we come here, you want it to do that. Just go to your MIDI menu and go to your CC automation setup. And at this point we could choose, okay, I want it to, you know, see this, we could have global settings. So we could say record destination, let's say, okay, I want instead of in the MIDI part, globally, I want it to be an automation track. So as I record any MIDI CCs, it just automatically is displayed here in the automation lanes as opposed to being uh, embedded in the MIDI part itself. So try setting it up there. So once again, go to your MIDI menu to your CC automation setup. And once you, you could configure that globally or set individual uh, CCs to do in the, you know, in the part or as automation as your needs see fit. So give that a shot. And that's why you don't necessarily see it in the uh, MIDI remote. 
because MIDI remote is remote controlling different aspects as opposed to just transmitting and recording the MIDI data. All right. Um, so we just see, hi, why can't Steinberg make it so that you can easily uh, change tempo with a tap function, say on a MIDI controller? Uh, in my opinion, it's not enough that you can access the tempo change via a tempo track. All right, so let's say I have, I'll just revert this project here quickly. Okay, so let's say we'll look at our mix console. All right, so there's a couple ways to do this. One is you could actually just record a MIDI data. So let's say if I'm here uh, and I just wanted to record, so I'm just gonna tap along. So if you wanna do this, one of the things that you could do is if you have MIDI data itself, uh, so if you wanna do it from a MIDI controller, at this point, we could go to MIDI to functions and then choose merge tempo from tapping. And we can make a tempo map uh, based on bar, quarter note, half note, whatever. Uh, we could also just while we're playing this and I'm gonna place all of these events into musical mode, just to show this. So make sure they're all musical mode. So let's say if I want to set a new tempo, try going to your project menu to the beat calculator say tap tempo and now I'll hit OK and we can say insert at tempo track start so I could just come and come here hit tap tempo and just hit my space bar and I'll say insert at tempo track start and then you so you could just tap tempo using your space bar so if you haven't tried that, um, give that a shot because you could just do it while it's playing. Um, so once again, you go to the project to uh, beat calculator. And at that point, just hit your space bar or click your mouse, uh, tap along, and then you could just insert it at the tempo track start. Or if you wanted to do it at a particular position, you could, you know, do that as well. So if I just come here and say, okay, let's, so give that a shot and let me know if that works for you. A lot of people don't use it that way, but it should be able to accomplish what you want. All right, we see Matt Elliston. Thanks for checking in from London. Chat field jumped on me. Okay. All right, so we see Soren is, uh, he's in a concert right now. So how dare you go attend a live concert while Club Cubase is going on. But thanks for checking in. And because you're absent, you have to hit the like button. And if you do learn a new tip or trick, make sure you do hit the like button and subscribe to the channel. All right, and we see Rich Cole is saying hi from St. Louis. All right, so we have Patricio checking in from New Jersey. Uh, question, I have multiple audio takes from the same song. I'm compiling into one song. Uh, some edits produce a click. Uh, any tips to fix that? So generally, any time that you're going to be doing, uh, like, you know, audio edits, and depending on the edit itself, uh, we just find something that may be more prone to this. So let's say we'll look at our bass part, and we'll make this larger and let's say if i've done 
an edit here. I'll just take my snap off. And let's say at this point, I cut right here. And let's say at this point, uh, we have the amplitude kind of going up and I make the edit kind of, you know, something that would cause a bit of a pop or crackle as we, as we make this particular edit. So when you do edits like this, your friend is going to be kind of the crossfade editor. So um, all you have to do is slightly overlap the two events and then hit the letter X and that will just do a crossfade. Uh, we could come over here and adjust kind of the start and stop of the crossfade. If you double click, you could actually, you know, edit the crossfade and get a more detailed crossfade edit right there. But if you haven't done that, you know, even if you are doing lots of edits, if you do a classical music all the time, you know, one of the things that's going to be, you know, imperative is crossfades because uh, they're often doing such detailed edits. So even just selecting two events that are next to each other will do just a crossfade so that you'll have kind of a seamless transition. So if you haven't experimented with crossfades, select the two events and then hit the letter X. All right, uh, so we just see uh, from Jay from Connecticut uh, says, hi, Greg, I'm a bit stuck. Is there something about event start which interferes with hit point movement? Um, is it possible to make Cubase uh, detect free warp points uh, to calculate tempo? Um, so let's say if we come here so let's say okay um let me just find i'll just go back to another project and we will come over to uh where we have a quick drum loop so often if we have an event here let's just revert quickly Okay, so you know if we are here, we could just say, um, okay, and so we have this. So let's see. Um, so is there something about the event start which uh, interferes with hit point movement? So if we have our hit points, um, so you know if we wanted to do this, let's say for our hit points. Uh, I will just in the sample editor. So once we double click on the event to open it in the sample editor, we'll see the sample editor inspector. Uh, we will now come over here and we could create. So let's say, okay, we want to find our slices. So let's say we want to have our threshold like this. So this seems to be catching all of the transients. Um, so, you know, the hit point start, you know, if we look, there will be um, a hit point kind of, you know, so I'm not sure if this is the start point that you're talking about, but, you know, if we look, uh, there is a hit point here. So let's say, you know, we could see that. Uh, let's see the second part of the question. Is it possible to make uh, Cubase detect free warp points to calculate tempo. So once free warp points have been created, um, so if I was doing this, let's say from the hit points, if you just make MIDI notes here, so we'll have MIDI notes, then we could do tempo detection based upon this particular event. Um, if you're doing, you know, a lot of times when people are doing hit points, they may be working on grooves. 
So we could, you know, from our hit points again, when we come over here, you know, we could take our hit points and convert those to warp markers so that once we're in warp editing, all those will be carried over. And the hit points can also be done to just uh, to create grooves. So if we say, okay, let's take this particular groove. So if I say, let's make a groove out of this, when we go to our quantize, we could see that we will uh, just have this. But if you just kind of set the hit points, you know, for, you know, like let's say the, the beats, at that point you could just, you know, turn it into MIDI and then from the MIDI do tempo detection based on that. So it's kind of a, a two-step process, but you can still get to the same place in the long run. All right, so we have a question from Brian. Uh, just picked up Yamaha, or maybe it's a comment. We'll see. Just picked up Yamaha 5-inch monitors to add to my 8-inch focals. Is there a way to set the focals for lower frequencies and the Yamahas to higher frequencies? Um, what's, you know, not really where they could be, uh, you know, utilized at the same time. Uh, you could, you know, if you really wanted to, you could set up maybe it's probably, I probably wouldn't suggest it for that, you know, cause they're both set up as full range monitors. Uh, you know, even though they may have different frequency response, um, you know, you could play around with, if you go into, uh, the control room, if we set up the monitors. Um, so let's go and come to our audio connections. And maybe if when you go to the control room, even there, it's not going to necessarily, you know, we could play through one set of speakers. Uh, and then we could have the different frequency responses, but I don't think it's going to get you what you want to accomplish because, you know, usually like subwoofers, when you add a subwoofer, we'll have a built-in crossover for that. Um, you know, you might be able to do, you know, if in a pinch, you might be able to do like direct routing. So let's say if we had, um, you know, two different groups, you know, so let's say if we add two different group channels, and this is if you really wanted to experiment with this, uh, and you may find it less than satisfactory. Okay, so on this, and let's say this group is going out to, you know, outputs one and two, let's say the HS5s, and this group we could send to different outputs that are configured in our audio um, connections. So let's say, you know, we have our two groups. This is going out of, you know, outputs one and two. This is going out of outputs three and four. So we could route everything through, if we go into our large mix console, we could take our sources and route them We'll activate from the racks direct routing, and then we'll see our direct routing, and then we could send the destinations to the two different groups. So let's say, okay, I want to take you know this track, and I wanted to you know feed it into the two different direct. Um, so let me just. So, you know, as we would do our direct routing here, we could send it to the two different destinations and on the groups, you could do kind of a, you know, high pass, low pass filters. So let's say, you know, on your HS, you know, we could just say, okay, on our HS, we wanted this to only, we could activate kind of the low pass and high pass filters. Uh, 
but you know and it, you know so basically what you could you know do is just say okay you know this monitor is only getting these frequencies uh so this could be like for your hs um but i i don't think it would be you know so you could experiment with that and send it to two different outputs through direct routing and then have each of those outputs kind of eq'd to only pass particular frequencies um but what I would always recommend is to, you know, use both of them to get a, a reference and have them both configured in your monitors. And at this point, you could just kind of switch back and forth between the two monitors. And if it sounds great in both sets of speakers, it's probably going to sound great in overall. So and that's probably why you bought like a secondary, you know, set of speakers for that. Congratulations on your new HS5s. I like the HS7s a lot. Okay, so we have a question. Uh, is any way to select the track with uh, full vent in Cubase just by clicking on the track uh, on the left zone. Okay. Okay. So I'm not sure if you're, if you want to select all of the events here, um, just rereading this. So, you know, there is, like, if we have multiple events. So, I'm not sure if you want to select, all, have all the events selected when this is turned on. There is an edit. Uh, and I think if we go to um, select, you know, all events, all on selected tracks. So... You know, as you do, so I don't think that there's a way to do this. One shortcut could be that if you shift double click on the first event, that all the events will be selected, but you might have to select the track and then um, just simply, um, and then at that point, simply just execute to select all on tracks if that's what you want to do. So if I'm misunderstanding, just let me know. Okay, so we have a question from Jay. Uh, there used to be number pad plus hotkey to go back to the beginning of audio editor. Maybe memory is fritzing, uh, but I'm having issues going back to the beginning of the editor. All right, so let's say uh, I wanted to go back. I wanted to navigate to the beginning of this editor. So let's say my, I'll just do it on a different project. Let's Okay, so let's say I wanted to just double click here. All right, so let's see if it's just. See if once we're in the editor here. So I mean, you can always, I usually say rewind, fast forward, um, but let's see if we can. Take this out of hit point mode. Okay, 
So I don't know of a key command to do that. Let's just take a. Here, let's see if I go enter B. That doesn't work. Yeah, so I don't know of a hotkey to do that. Let me just look in the key commands. Looking Yeah, so I don't know of a key command for that, but I could play around with it if you want to email me, Jay. Sorry about that. But I think usually if we just kind of double click here. I'm just seeing if we could so let's say if I double click here and then hit um, Alt P, let's see if that will just take us directly to the selected edit point and start to play from there. So maybe uh, whatever you have selected, maybe Alt or Option plus P. But if you want to email me, I'll, I could play around with it some more over the weekend. All right, so we have a question uh, from Loading Zone. Uh, hi, Greg. Uh, I'm wondering if there is any way while recording we can edit other tracks at the same time. For example, recording a track, you try to edit other tracks if it stops to record. Thank you. Um, so I, I've kind of done something similar. Like we had a, a it's a, in, in Boston in the US, we had a WGBH, and they often need to edit while they're in court recording or ingesting. So one thing that you can do is, let's say I'll just do a new project here. You know, because they have like eight minutes to ahead of time before they're, uh, when they're receiving the audio and they may need to do a quick edit. Uh, so I'm gonna add an audio track here. And when we go to the record mode, um, Let's go to the preferences and make sure that, and I think this may be set up by default. So let's come over here to record audio um, that we could have a one second uh, pre-record. Okay, so what I could do is, let's say I'm recording. All right, and at this point, I'm just gonna like punch in and punch out. All right, so people go, oh, you probably have a gap here. Um, so what I could do is I can now edit this particular audio event. So if I needed to cut this audio event here and, you know, okay, I need to erase that, I could do that. Now, you may notice that there would have been a gap as we've done that. So to kind of get rid of the gap where we punched in and punched out. So I'll just show this again. So once we have our one second gap here, so if we just do a quick. So once we do this, since we have that pre-record on, we could just simply roll back the beginning of that file so that you do have a seamless record. So this way you can punch in and out quickly, have this information 
uh, still there by rolling it back and do your edits on the previous events. So if you had to do it in the heat of battle, you know, make sure that you have that turned on, punch in, punch out. You can edit the previous event and then roll back uh, the uh, the subsequent event so that there's no gap between the two. So that way it'd be kind of a seamless recording. So let me know if that works for you. All right, uh, so we see, um, so uh, does Cubase have multi-mono? So, you know, Cubase and a lot of programs kind of work with multi-mono because for the longest time they didn't work with stereo files. You know, so Cubase can have, a, a, you know, a, a mono stereo, inter, you know, stereo interleaved, 5.1 interleaved, or 7.1.4 interleaved for doing stuff like for Atmos. Um, if you need it to like on a stereo audio track, so and this is isn't the prettiest uh, way of doing it. So let's say if I add a, a stereo track and I need it to do kind of multi mono, what we could do is let's say we do it as an insert. Um, at this point, we could add two of the same uh, plugins. Let's say we just do a compressor and a compressor. Sometimes you'll have plugins which will allow you to, you know, deal with the left and right channels independently. So let's say if we wanted to come over here uh, and once we open up this particular channel, we'll see our routing. We could choose to have these both set to mono. And then we double click on the routing. We could actually just choose to switch the routing over. So that this insert is doing the left channel, this insert is processing the right channel. So I know it's not as elegant as maybe our solutions, but if you had to do it, that's, that would be an approach to do it. All right, so we see just kind of uh, another, um, uh, just with Jay's question, I think that this was maybe, um, you know, uh, about the, within the sample editor, navigating says, however, uh, attempting to go to the beginning of the timeline, cycle marker unselected. So wherever you're at, if you wanted to go to the beginning of the project timeline is you could just hit the period key on the numeric keypad and that will take you to the very beginning. So think of it as like a RTZ, like a return to zero. So wherever you're at, if you hit the period key, that will take you back to the particular beginning of the project. All right, wonderful to see Uno Memento on the live stream from Finland. We hope you're, you and your family are all recovered. We're seeing people weighing in on drummer versus uh, audience perspective. And so if it sounds good, it sounds good. So I've never heard anyone say, oh, it's such a great mix, except for the hi hats on the wrong side. You know. All right, so we have a question. Uh, hi, I'm uh, changing from Pro Tools to Cubase. Where can I find all the shortcuts for Cubase, Basic, and Advanced? So I think probably Jazz Dude has posted a, you know, a, there's, I think he has a link to all the key commands. Um, so, you know, that is, I'm sure he'll probably share it. It's probably in the live stream. But if you go <clears throat> to the Cubase Nation Discord, you could do that, but you could always, if you wanted to see what particular key commands do and what they control is if you go to your edit menu to key commands, you can see them all listed here. 
And if you're like, oh, I hit I hit this key and it did something weird, you could just uh, if you come to this area, you could type in the keyboard shortcut and it'll show you what function that key does. Or you could search for a function here and it'll take you there so you could find the particular uh, keyboard shortcut or assign one directly there. Uh, for transitioning, you could always come over here and see the presets and there are some Pro Tools keyboard shortcuts. But if you learn the Cubase keyboard shortcuts, it really you know will probably make you faster than kind of doing all sorts of um, transition, so you can build up your muscle memory. Okay. Reading through comments. And so John Costigan is asking Michael Pierce if he's a drummer perspective man on mixing. So. All right, wonderful to see Grant Nicholas on the live stream from Baltimore. All right, uh, all right. so Grant is just saying uh, he needs a function to doing warp editing on the arrange window. So yeah, Steinberg thought about that as well, so that's why they added it in version 12. So really all you have to do is come over here, we'll see our free warp tool, and then we could just select free warp right here. And if we wanted to now, uh, you know, one of the things is if we have hit points that have been detected on a particular event, we can go to your audio, and then we'll see under real-time processing, we could create warp markers of uh, to the particular event. So as we select our warp tool, we can now have all of our warp markers and we could just move different elements like so. And if we wanted to do this across multiple tracks, so let's say I want to select all of these tracks and we go to our warp tool. So we change our warp tools, you know, added free warp on the project window. So now, once we do this, you know, we can just put in, so I have multiple tracks selected, I could just double click, and you may not see it until you zoom in, but we could just double click here, and now we could just move multiple points, just like so. And with this, uh, if you have these into a group track, we could uh, say just, uh, we could activate the phase coherent audio warp. So we could do that as well. So it's in musical mode, so I'll just abort that quickly. Let's see, it's writing files here. All right, so yeah, so let me know if that works for you, Grant. So that was in, uh, and this also is really good for uh, if you have like, you know, two, two microphones on a guitar. So if we wanted to just kind of
So if I wanted to take, you know, both of these guitar parts here and be able to, you know, select both guitar parts. So just select and let's add warp markers. So if you find that, you know, one particular uh, phrase was just a little bit out. So again, just hold down shift, select both. Let's get to the warp marker. We could drop in the warp marker on these particular events and then just kind of move freely to adjust different rhythmic timing very easily. So we'll give you that feature free for having your issues with the very audio and having it reset with your color scheme. See Grant Nicholas saying he feels like an idiot for missing that. We'll just think it's like Christmas in August for you. We'll give you that feature absolutely free. No downloads necessary. All right, so we have Madge Deepers checking in from the UK. Thanks for joining us. And it's apparently melting and hot, hot, hot. So. All right, so a question. Um, all of commercial libraries for Groove Agent 5 working with the e-licensor, uh, so just factory working without. So I think all of, you know, I don't think any of the add-on libraries like the Simon Phillips or the Marco Miniman or the Nashville drums, I don't think any of those uh, are working on the Steinberg licensing. So, you know, I think that, you know, we may see, you know, so, so far currently it's going to be, uh, in order, you know, Dorco, Cubase, Nuendo, Spectral Layers, uh, Groove Agent, uh, Five, you have standalone license and Backbone, uh, and Wave Lab. So all those are, so the other ones, you know, it's kind of a transition period, uh, so those would, you know, those content libraries would still need to utilize the e-licensor currently. I think they all will be migrating over. Uh, they're working first on making sure, uh, you know, to get kind of the core applications. And then once we have kind of all the different uh, instruments to play back the libraries. Um, so, like, you know, Halion isn't on a new licensing system yet. Halion Sonic is. So, you know, as you know, but I know the teams are working on it. So. All right. So we see Madge Deepers is waiting for. For uh, Michael Teens's ice cream distribution since it's so hot. Okay, uh, so you see just confirmation uh, it says, I mean, uh, you have two tracks, Greg, and uh, you're recording on the first track while recording on, when you select the second track, it stops recording on the first track. That's what I meant. Uh, is there any solution for it? So let's go ahead and take a look. Thanks for the clarification. Sorry for misunderstanding. So it might be a preference. Okay, so let's try without. Um, I'm just gonna turn off a preference. So under editing, uh, I think project in mix consoles of enable record on selected audio track. Okay, so let's say I'm recording here. So let's say I select this track. That one continues to record and I'll take it out of cycle 
Sorry about that. So annoying. All right. All right. So let's say I have this track recording. All right. And then I want to select a different track. So this one, when I select a different track, still stays in record. Then I can record, turn that on and off here without affecting this track's record enable status. So again, let me know if that's what, uh, what you're looking to do loading soon. So, and again, the preference to change that behavior is you go to your preferences under editing to project and mix console and just choose to uh, uncheck enable record on selected audio track. So let me know if that does a trick for you. So I think it will. All right, uh, so question, uh, how do I skip the VST3 check during loading of Cubase? It takes ages to load and sometimes crashes. So often what that's, you know, often why it's taking a long time is maybe there's problematic plugins. So as Cubase is doing that, you may have VST3 plugins that are crashing and that's why it, it takes a while. Uh, so generally kind of the first time you go through the process, you know, Cubase will do an analysis and will kind of do almost like an integrity check of the, of all the plugins and measure the latency of the plugin while it's booting up. Uh, now if the plugin kind of shows up on the block list, um, you know, that could be, that means that that plugin is maybe a little fishy, even if it's VST3. Generally, VST3 plugins are going to be more stable than VST2 plugins. Um, but, and often as you do that, you know, once it's loaded up and then you close Cubase down, it should retain those settings until there's another, uh, another particular plugin change. Uh, but sometimes if the plugin was ignored on the first time, it may just kind of go through that process. So you could try to see, you know, probably if you, you know, activate only particular VST plugins in the VST plugin manager, you know, start with just, if you hold down alt control shift or command option shift right after you double click on Cubase to start the program, you could choose to open it without third-party plugins and you can see how fast it goes. So it's often kind of the plugins themselves that could be causing the delay on startup. So and if you have a plugin that's crashing, that would be kind of indicative that that plugin is probably going to be the culprit. So. All right, so we see more discussion uh, on the uh, perspective of drummers, of drum panning. All right. All right, and we see Rich Cole just saying, uh, question, could one argue audience perspectives equals mono drummers perspective equals panning? So I guess you could, so. Jazz dude mentioning no bot activity. You probably just jinxed it. Uh, but I did mention it to kind of our social media managers and they were going to be looking into it to see what they could do as well. So we we're just kind of have an email discussion on it yesterday. So I'm not sure if anything has happened, but we'll see. There is one setting for make stricter, but no real idea what make stricter does. So, but we'll cross our fingers that we have bot free activity today.
Okay, uh, so we have a um, question. Hello, Greg. What is the fastest way to change a given control keyboard in the input routing field in the inspector of multiple tracks simultaneously? Thank you. Okay, so I guess this would be for MIDI. So let's say if I wanted to add instrument tracks um, and just for time expediency. All right, so let's say if I had multiple tracks and these are all set to mon to all MIDI inputs, so I'll select these. I think if you hold down Alt or Option plus Shift and say, okay, I want these all to be coming from my Choice Sauce controller, that now all of those selected tracks will be set to the Choice Sauce controller. And if we are doing this with audio, I think it's gonna be the same. So let's say, okay, I wanna add a number of audio tracks here and I wanna set the input to half inch analog, we'll just say. So now all of the selected tracks will be set. So try, if you want it to set it to the same input for multiple tracks, Select the tracks, hold down Alter Option plus Shift and change one of them. And this is kind of like doing, you know, we could think of it as what we see in the mix console with the quick link. Uh, so Alt Option plus Shift and then make one setting. All right, so just see um, <clears throat> uh, what is in place editor. So we see a comment from Jazz Dudes as a dominated video today. But if you want to kind of check out what the in place editor does, we'll show it to you quickly here. Sorry if you hear my son watching Mythbusters in the background here. All right, so let's say um, we want to look at uh, our in-place editor. So I think that the key command for this is um, Control-Shift-I. And what that's going to allow you to do is to basically have... Um, you know, when we look at this, it's basically going to be the MIDI editor on the project window. So let me just change my routing here real quick. Sorry about that. So now at this point, we could uh, just see our particular part. So if we select the track, uh, at this point, we can just hit Control or Command Shift plus I, and then you could just see kind of the MIDI editors directly on the project window, like so. And one of the advantages that this has over the key editor, and hopefully this will be something that you know Steinberg will address, but you could use the range selection tool. So let's say if I had um, these events. And I'll move these events over here. Uh, and I want it to copy these events but maintain their position within the measure. Within the editor here, we could just select the range of those events. And now if I just hit Command D, we can still keep kind of the space before and after and paste based on kind of relative values like that as well. So, um, and one other thing if you wanted to do with the in place editor, um, so if we come here, it's control shift I to close. And one of the great things we could do is if we right click on a particular track, we could go to the track control settings. And if we want it a little icon to automatically open the in place editor, we can see that we have all these hidden controls here. So at this point, we could say edit in place, and then we could move it directly to from a hidden control to a visible control. 
And now every time that we come here, we could now just do uh, our edit in place. So, and we could just come right here and just turn on and off in place editing directly there from the particular icon. Uh, all right, so see, question, um, hi uh, from Cameroon. Uh, I have some instrument tracks uh, with played MIDI contents, but I would like to use MIDI tracks instead. Is there a way to convert them to MIDI tracks and keep those events? So often what I would do is let's say I have these. Let me just go to a different project quickly. Open one up here. You know, so instrument tracks and MIDI tracks are going to be, you know, you, they both can, you know, send MIDI data out. MIDI tracks can send to external devices and also to uh, internal instruments, whereas an instrument track is only for a particular software. Uh, so, but you know, when we go to edit them, the functionality will be identical. There's some small minor differences, but if we want it, there isn't a convert to MIDI track or convert to instrument track. A lot of the differences that people, um, you know, that started with, and the intention was that uh, MIDI tracks would could be more flexible and it was kind of more of a paradigm of sending MIDI to a virtual rack, kind of like a rack or a, you know, a whole bunch of external keyboards. It was that exact same paradigm. And instrument tracks were set up to do more of, you know, very simple low D instrument. It has its connection because, you know, has its audio connections defined immediately and it's kind of more simple. Um, but if I wanted to just take this instrument track and convert it to, an, to a MIDI, I would just add a MIDI track right below. And then all you have to do is you could drag it. And if we hold down like the Alt key or Option key, we can make our copy, and if I moved it up or down vertically, up or down first, when I hit the control key, we can now lock it in the same exact position. So then we could take the same exact information that's here and just copy it down to a MIDI track without any worries of it shifting in time, and then we could route it to external instruments or to other software instruments being uh, that are loaded in the instrument rack. All right, so we have a question. Um, hi, Greg, thanks for answering so many questions. Is there a way to change the name of the track and the name of the audio file at the same time? Um, so if we want it to, I'll just do a new project. All right, so I'll just give this a name. Great. So we'll call it Che. Uh, so let's come over here. And so now when I record, it's going to automatically be named. So we'll arm this track for record. And at this point, we hit record. So this audio file, when we do this, will carry the name from the track. So if we start with the track. Now, if we change this to, let's say, J guitar, um, this track is changed. The audio file isn't, or the event isn't changed. Now, if we want to change the event to the name of this, we can just hold down the command or control key, 
and that will now change the name of the event to from the track. Uh, but the audio file is still J01. So if we wanted to change the name of the audio file, we could click here in the file field of the info line. So as we do this, we could just kind of type it in here and change the name of the file itself. So we have track names, we have event names, and the actual audio file name. So if you wanted to take the you know take the track name and convert it to the um, to the event, hold you know select it and hold down Control Command and then hit Enter. That will rename it. Or you could just double click here in the field if you wanted to copy the name here, double click in this field and paste you could do that as well. So let me know if that's helpful. All right, uh, so we see question. Uh, is it possible in the future we have an insert on the insert a flashlight when it's clipping on a single plugin? Uh, it's very useful. It's not about copying. Thanks. Um, so um, I, I will mention that. So, you know, when we see kind of clipping. You know, on an event, we will generally, you know, see like the mixer channel itself turn red. So let me just drop a loop in. And I'll just add a lot of gain. So it's like, so, you know, as soon as there's clipping on a particular channel, so it doesn't indicate which particular plugin is causing the clipping, but on which particular track. Um, but I'll, I'll mention that as a feature request so that we could see if there's, you know, clipping on, uh, you know, at a particular insert point. Okay, we have a question from Jay. Uh, it says, sorry for all the questions today. You could ask as many questions as you want. That's the whole point of the live stream. So, you know, ask 100 questions. That's totally fine. Um, all right, so the question is, uh, are there any easy transport modifier keys to switch between the transport stop going to the beginning and stop in place and other transport mods? All right, so you know the one that I use all the time is, let's say, you know, we're here and we have this drum loop playing. So I'll just snap it to our grid just for OCD sake. All right, so, you know, if we have our space bar here, so when I come here, the default behavior is it'll stop and start right from where we left off. All right, so that's, and because this is, we could think of the space bar as being binary. It's stop or play, stop or play. Um, so it's using the same command. So if it, is in stop mode when you hit the space bar, it plays. Uh, when we go to, you know, and when it's playing, we hit the stop bar, it stops. Now, there is a preference to change this behavior. So if we go to preferences, uh, we could go to preferences and under transport, we could see uh, return to start position on stop. So if this is checked, uh, now when I hit this space bar, it goes directly back to where we were. Now I have set up a key command of shift plus space bar to change the behavior. So if I want it to go on, and now I want it to go back, I hit shift plus space bar, and now it'll go back to the starting point. And to set that command, we would come over to key commands and look under preferences. 
So I'll just say, and once we go to, let's say preferences, and you'll see under transport, I have a return to start position on stop. So I could, if I want to use the space bar in kind of two different ways, I could just toggle that behavior again. So now when I stop, it stops in place. So now I hit shift plus space, it goes back. Now, another way of doing this, if you have a numeric keypad, which is always really helpful in Cubase because it gives you a lot of great functions, uh, depending on your, you could hit the zero key for stop and the enter key for play. So I'm gonna toggle this behavior. All right, so we're gonna deactivate the return to start position. So now when I hit play, using the enter key of the numeric keypad, and I hit the zero key once, it stops in place. I hit it twice, it goes back to its, re goes back to its play position. So let's say now I hit enter on the numeric keypad. So you hit it once, stops in place, hit it twice, it goes back to the return, to the start position. So that's a great way of working if you have numeric keypads. Sometimes a lot of people are running laptops that don't have numeric keypads. Um, so, but that's always a, a wonderful function because that way you could just kind of work two different ways because the stop key isn't strictly binary. There's a separate play key and a separate stop key to stop in place, hit it again, return to the start position. So if you kind of experiment with those, those should help. All right, so we have a question. Um, in some cases, when opening a project, my info, uh, I think it says my into plays fine, maybe intro plays fine, yet where a few more tracks with data start, I get a dropout in audio. Might this be caused by buffer size? So, you know, if you come over, you could definitely increase buffer size, you know, because, you know, as tracks could be doing, as more information is handling, more sounds are being played from virtual instruments, you know, first thing I would do is come over to uh, your, you know, select your audio interface and raise the buffer size. One other thing that you could do, um, you know, that you might want to try experimenting with is if you go to preferences and go to VST, um, we'll see just under plugins, you'll see suspend VST3 plugin processing uh, when no audio signals are received. So sometimes you may start off, if you have like a really big project and let's say you start with a guitar part, uh, and you have like one plugin on and then the whole band kicks in and you have like, you know, 50 plugins going on at once. At this point, it's only taking processing power when there's actual signal being processed through the audio with this preference checked. So it could be that, you know, as the song builds, more activity, more instruments, more real-time audio processing going on that it could take more CPU cycles. Uh, but regardless, uh, raising the buffer is always going to help and kind of, you know, think of it like, you know, you can think of it like a bad I Love Lucy, you know, working in a factory scene, you know, it just slows the conveyor belt down so that you could get more widgets into a box. Um, you know, so it's just giving you more of a buffer to do that. All right. Um, all right. So we have a question from Roger. Uh, says, is there an option to set the three colors for the sample editor only? I used a bluish scheme, uh, but the light gray wave frame and wave itself is nearly invisible. Okay. So let's come over here. I'll take this track and let's make it kind of 
yellowish color. So when we double click, we'll see this in the sample editor. All right, so when we come to You know, there's different color schemes here. So it looks like it's gonna be kind of the event color. Let me just see if I could, so if we change the color here of the event, we'll see. So let's see if we have this set to auto. All right, but now let's also take a look at some of the preferences because these may affect it as well. So let's come over here to um, event display audio. And let me just reread the question one more time. See if these have any effect in the sample editor. We'll also come over here to our track and channel. Let's see if we adjust. So it looks like it will kind of change it there. So it looks like it's gonna be kind of always derived from um, the event here itself. Um, but I'll mention that as a, as a feature request. So it could be more similar to like the MIDI editors. Sorry about that, Roger. Um, it says you use a lighter color. So one thing, let me just check this other preference here. Sorry about that. Now let's see if we do the waveform brightness. So, you know, maybe the color strength. So, but, so maybe like if you use it, perhaps a different color. Okay. Okay, we see from loading soon. Uh, just saying thank you, Greg, for the answer on my question about recording and editing in multi-tracks. All right, so hopefully that helps. Okay, so we have a question uh, from Mr. Morpheus. Uh, hey, Greg, can you change audio to MIDI in Cubase? So what you could really, what it's really kind of intended to do is to take a monophonic audio event. Let's see, uh, now when I come here, we can see that this audio because of the waveform brightness. So let me just 
them back to previous question. I guess it's not carried over into the sample editor. Uh, all right, but let's say turning the audio into um, into MIDI. So if we want, so it's intended for a bonophonic source. If you have like guitars or pianos are playing chords or, or string parts that are playing chords, it's not designed to do that. But if it's something like a vocal, we could double click, go into the sample editor. And at this point, uh, go to audio warp. And as we do our free warp settings here, Uh, but and then you'll see from the functions menu, let me just do it on another project here quickly. Sorry, if we get a very audio. Sorry, I had her wrong. So once we do the analysis here in very audio, and then we'll see under functions, we could then just uh, extract MIDI from the audio performance. So if we wanted to do that, we could carry over different pitch bend curves and we'll hit OK. And now we could just have the MIDI part that's created just to match the audio. All right, we have a question from Paul Claridge. Thanks for being on the live stream today. All right, so Paul's question is, um, uh, can you go through the settings for the icons on the track? Uh, you just showed us how to uh, show the edit in place icon. What options do we have in that dialog? So it's gonna be different for every type of track. So let's say, um, I'll just do a new project here. And let's say with an audio track, and let's say instrument track. Okay, so we'll right click and go to the track control settings. So, you know, elements that are hidden, you know, we could, you know, easily open up Kind of inserts, EQ, sends. I'll just go ahead and add all these. Uh, the listen, we could lock tracks. We could toggle time base. We could also freeze uh, all the different tracks. So now on my audio track, we could have these all kind of laid out for more options. Uh, and then, you know, once we go to our track control settings, we'll have, you know, different functions for different types of tracks. A so MIDI. We could have all of these other different icon sampler tracks, you know, marker tracks. We could have, you know, all, you know, chord tracks, you know, if we want to lock, folder tracks. So different uh, components that by default are visible and some that are, um, you know, invisible, you know, but you have the option to do that and you could pick for these to be in different rows, the width of different functions as well. So a lot of great options. So if you just kind of click here, you could see what uh, different options are there, visible and visible for different track types. Uh, all right, so we see um, 
Can you demonstrate how to set up an expression map using BBCO, BBC SO core? So I don't have it on this machine, um, but if you wanted to come over here, we would go to MIDI menu, and then we would go to expression map setup. So I think a lot of the Spitfire stuff, I was just kind of playing uh, with the BBC, whatever the discover um, recently at someone's studio. Um, so I think when we come over here, we want to just say, okay, we want to do um, our key switch here. So let's say our remote key, let's say is gonna be C0 and we'll give this a name. So we'll call this short and let's say C sharp zero is going to be long. And you could set these to be, you know, so in, so this way, you know, depending on what articulations are available, you know, you can just simply come over here and create these and then you know, once you're done, uh, you could save this as, you know, BBC SO flute. You know, so whatever that you want to call up and, you know, we could have these each be, you know, articulate, you know, you could have it, you know, just doing the key switches just like that for all of the available articulations. And then once you open it up, you can say, okay, I have a MIDI track. Um, and now when we go to within the MIDI editor here, or we'll just go to, and we'll see our expression maps. So we double click on the event to go into the edit page. And at this point, you could just say, let's load up that particular expression map like so. I don't know all of the available. There's a good chance that the expression maps are, are already created and you could just download them and just simply, uh, you know, open them up directly from the expression map editor. All right, um, so we see question. Uh, Hi, Greg, what are the advantages of printing slash recording the master out on a track instead of exporting it? And what's the fastest way to do it and save it externally? Um, so what a lot of people will do, um, so I'm not sure if it's faster anymore. Um, you know, and I think a lot of people would do this before the batch processing got a lot more sophisticated with different effects processing options. But let's say uh, if we're, this may actually kind of have it set up. Right, I'm just gonna set my preferences here back my defaults. Okay, so like right now we can have a number of audio tracks. So if I wanted to take, you know, all of these, you know, different tracks, uh, so let's say, okay, I want to take all of these tracks here. Um, and then I could right click and let's send it to a group track. And we'll call this summing. So now every source could be going 
just right here. We have some of the reverbs that are probably sent to Prefader. Wow. So if we wanted to, you know, record this, um, you know, we could just as we showed earlier, I could add a audio track. So if I wanted to now record <clears throat> in real time, <clears throat> and this could be good if it's if you have a lot of external instruments because you have to record in real time as well. And maybe if you're mixing, uh, we could add an audio track here and set its input from our summing group. So when we come over here to our groups, now everything could be routed to our summing group and we could pass audio in. So I know a lot of people, I've seen composers that will set up, you know, very elaborate templates because they need more flexibility with effects processing. Like if the same reverb was being used on the timpani and the violins, when they exported the violin stem, they didn't want the timpani reverb to be fed in. So they would do a lot of you know recording of groups internally and have effects for the strings be only on one particular group the effects for brass on one group uh, but with cubase 12 it kind of mitigated that problem by not by kind of figuring out that we don't want the reverb from another source being fed in when we do a group channel export so it may not be as if you're working all with virtual instruments um, you know, so if you're working entirely with virtual instruments, it may not be a huge advantage if you're incorporating virtual instruments and a lot of external instruments. Uh, then all you have to do is, you know, th then it could be a viable option. So, all right, so we have X Cubase X checking, saying uh, another fantastic hangout. Um, so you're welcome. Thanks. Thanks for joining us today. Okay, so we have a question. Uh, how do you set up surround sound 5.1? Um, so really what you probably, if you're working in surround in 5.1, the best way to do it is as, as we, uh, you want to have six speakers, you know, I've uh, probably five of the same speakers and an LFE or subwoofer, we would go to the audio connections, go to outputs, uh, and then we could add an output and we will add a 5.1 output bus. So we'll just come here and we could define our left, right, center, LFE, and our left and right surrounds. And Obviously, we'd probably want an audio interface that had at least six outputs so that we could feed the speakers directly uh, this way. Now, as we go to add a particular audio track, um, so if we add a number of audio tracks and we'll set its configuration here to 5.1. Now, as we go to add audio tracks, and we go look at the panner, we'll notice that we now have a 5.1 panner that we could just have access to right here. So as soon as the uh, particular track is then routed out to the 5.1 output, when you go to the panner, you can just do your surround panning there. So that's how you could work in 5.1. All right, uh, so we see a uh, question. Uh, I'm setting up control room again. I don't hear loops in the media bay as preview. I remember there was something I have to do, but I don't remember what. Uh, thanks for your help. So generally, you know, if, when we want to preview loops, uh, you know, it's always helpful if you have the control room activated so that, you know, we could just find some different audio ones. So as I, you know, now we could just immediately activate and audition our loops. So generally, this is routed through the control room. As we're doing this, 
Uh, if you don't hear it, you know, one is make sure that we have preview activated. So, and that you have, there's a volume control here. So you may just be auditioning and maybe the volume control is down here on the media bay. So as we, again, come here, select our different But also make sure that, you know, if you have the control room set up, that when you go to the audio connections, at this point when you go to the control room, that um, you have the speakers, you know, set and configured here. And you could probably leave the uh, main outputs set to not connected. So, but then that should help you here and preview the loops. All right, we see Gerald Ely joining us from California. Thanks for being a part of the live stream. We hope you're doing well. All right, and we see uh, Andy Racks the cams. See if I'm reading it right. Uh, just saying hi. Thanks for joining us. All right, we see Madge Deepers likes her uh, editor's keys with all the Cubase shortcuts kind of written on the particular keys, so that's great. All right, and we have Wilhelm Campman checking in, saying hi from Germany. Thanks for being a part of the live stream tonight, spending your Friday evening with us in Germany. All right, uh, so we just see a um, question from Jazzy Lamel. Uh, hello, I may miss the question, but can you show me on how to change the key into a recorded vocal audio? All right, so let's say if I wanted to, uh, we'll just go to this song here. Do you recall? So if I wanted to like transpose and you know, it, so sometimes this may not be a key like going from A major to you know A minor. Um, but if we wanted to transpose, a quick way of doing this is to add a transpose track. So I'm going to right click, we'll select Add Track, and let's go to Transpose. All right. So now we have our transpose track, and let me just come over here and we'll just play a little bit of our song so we'll we'll get kind of our basic tonality do here so I can grab my pencil tool and we'll say right here I'm gonna click and we'll say let's transpose up so I'll just say let's go up a whole step say I wanted to go down a whole step here. You look my way and your heart shone through. You caught my breath while you caught me too. Well, we go back to our home key. So this is globally transposing all the audio and MIDI. So say right here I want to go up a major third. So if you haven't experimented with the transpose track, you know, it's a great way to see, you know, take your whole project and if the singer's not feeling the key, just change it. And often you can say, oh, it wasn't the key. That was the problem. So, uh, so play around with that. So again, it doesn't switch it, you know, to like, okay, it's not going to say, okay, oh, let's make it an E mixolydian mode, uh, but you can transpose up or down.
Gerald Ely is just saying he loves the I Love Lucy reference. Yeah. It's, it's a pretty accurate description of what the audio processing is going on. So I'm not sure if it's just cultural to the United States or not. So, but maybe I Love Lucy is universal. reading through comments. Thanks for all the wonderful questions. And if you've learned a new trick or two, make sure that you hit the like button and subscribe to the channel. Sorry, my chat field jumped on me. All right, so I think I'm back. All right, so just see a question uh, from XQBase X. Uh, another question appears, my always on top is inverted. Uh, I have a Halion instrument open on the second monitor as well as a browser. If I click on the browser and Halion window vanishes under browser, if always on top is selected, but it stays, uh, but it stays it off. Well, that wasn't clear. If always on top, the Halion window disappears under browser and it is off, it remains visible. So I think that the always on top may be referencing more, not the operating system, but the window behavior within the Apple your Cubase, but within Cubase itself, so. All right, uh, so we see a uh, question. Is it a way to write a macro for converting multiple instrument tracks and their recorded contents to MIDI tracks, please? Okay, so let's see what we could do. All right, so let's say we have Okay, so let's create a macro, see if we could do this. Okay, so we'll call this instrument to MIDI. Okay, so the first thing we want to do is select all events. On tracks. Okay, so we'll add this. And we want to now add a MIDI track. Right, before we do that, we'll choose to copy. OK, 
Okay, so we want, sorry, wrong command. Okay, so we're gonna select all on the tracks. We're going to copy the event. We're gonna add a MIDI track. We're going to then navigate down. And then we're gonna do a paste at origin. All right, so let's see if this works. Instrument MIDI. All right, we'll give it a name. So there it pasted it. Let's just see. All right, so let me just go ahead and we'll select. All right, so I'm going to select all on tracks. I'm gonna do this manually and see. So all on selected tracks, we're gonna copy. I'm gonna add the MIDI track. Give it a name. and then paste. Okay, so I think I don't have to do the navigate down command, so let me just try that. Okay, and I'll just select I'll just make a copy of this event over here, just so we could see. It'll okay, so let's just come over here, instrument to MIDI. And then, so that will just kind of copy it just like that. So, um, so you, you probably could do that for multiple tracks, but you may have to give a name, uh, but you may want to just kind of do it one track at a time. So again, the macro, so you want to come over here to under key commands uh, and make sure that you show macros and it's just four steps. I called it uh, listen or instrument to MIDI. So we're going to add, select all on the track. So we're going to select the track. We're going to have that selected. It's going to uh, select all on the tracks. We're going to paste. We're going to add a MIDI track, which will prompt you to name the track, and then edit, paste uh, at origin. So again, if we wanted to do that whole process, instead of having to do those four steps, we could just come over here, and you could assign a keyboard shortcut to this. So we could just say uh, instruments to MIDI, Piano and boom, it's done. So let give that a try and let me know if that speeds up your process for you. Uh, 
Uh, so we see for a question from Madge Deepers. Uh, has anyone got a stream deck? And if so, what do you think of it working with Cubase? So I went through and set up kind of like every uh, single menu function uh, to be and you know, like every preference, every like sub menu of a sub menu uh, to all be triggered from my stream deck using the generic remote. So, and I found it worked great. Um, so and I like having kind of nested uh, controls and, you know, it takes a while to kind of get set up. Uh, but I, I think it's a, a really handy little thing just because, you know, like mine, I think has 32 buttons, but each button could be a folder and could trigger different things. So, and, you know, you'd, I downloaded like the little MIDI template so that each button could be transmitting a MIDI note or MIDI CC message. So. All right, so we see a question uh, from Mr. Morpheus. Uh, is there a live stream for WaveLab? So there is a uh, Justin Perkins, uh, who's a mastering engineer based in uh, Madison, Wisconsin. He does a, um, I think it's, Ma I'm not sure if it's Madison or Milwaukee or kind of between the two, but he does like once a month, they do a WaveLab live stream as well. But you know, if you have WaveLab questions, uh, I'm happy to answer them here as well, so. All right, so we have a question. Uh, hey, Greg, can you explain on how to use the effect sends? Uh, every time I use them, the volume of the track goes down through them. All right. Okay, so let's go ahead and I'll just take this vocal here and I'll just turn these off. So let's say we have a vocal I have to reply to something really quick. Hang on just one second, sorry. All right. All right, so effects in. So let's say I have my, uh, my vocal here. And we will just go ahead and play this vocal. Do you recall the day? First met. And I wanted to add, let's say, a reverb to it. So I'll just come over here. Let's say, in the seventh grade in the school parking lot, waiting on our telecoach. So I'll do this while we're just listening to the vocal. You looked my way and your heart shone through. It caught my breath while you called me to. So now we've added this. Well, leave it now. I'm so in love with you. Just like long, long So now what I could do ago. is I will blend the amount of the dry signal. Oh, I remember and then we could the blend the effect we in, adjusting the balance like between long, the two. Long time ago. And our first kiss, there was no regret. Right after that guard. Now if your effects return channel You told your daddy and he called my mom said you were too damn good for any boy that dumb. All right, so say I, I bring These this down. Sovereign words are now dead and dumb. It shouldn't really and that was a long, long time. So even ago. if that level is down, <clears throat> it shouldn't really make it softer. Now our two grown daughters are married with kids of their own. So here's like reverb and delay. We use and I track. know your dad's pretty happy now. 
Cause what began as our first kiss. So even taking these on and off. It started all of this. Usually doesn't affect the uh, signal being blended in. Zero. Now, if you're using, you know, generally sends will be used for like time-based effects where you want to share maybe the delay, the reverb, coursing, flanging, you know, and generally it's not for design for tracks that are going to be specific to like, you know, compressors and EQs. So that might cause, um, that might cause some issues as, you know, that could adjust the volume and maybe come up with a volume discrepancy. All right. I'll have Greg Jafria, amazing keyboard player calling, wonderful guy. I'll give him a call back after the live stream. You could Google him. He was into Banja Freya and Angel and very interesting life. All right. All right. Uh, so we see from X Cubase X, uh, which one do you recommend? Uh, Windows 11, Cubase Pro, uh, White, a few programs there. Um, So, you know, we have a lot of people running. I'm not sure if I understand fully, but we have lots of people running, uh, you know, Cubase, you know, 11 and Cubase 12, you know, great on Windows 11, but maybe it says uh, white, a few programs there. So maybe it's a typo. I'm not sure. Um, maybe it will be asked a little bit later. But if you want to ask again, sorry for being dense on that. All right, um, so it says, uh, question, uh, can you show us how to change MIDI input control on multiple MIDI or instrument tracks? Uh, quick links does not work. Um, so it's probably not if quick link is active, so, but if you have, if you use the same keyboard shortcuts for, for quick links. So I'll do new project here. And I'll just add number of instrument tracks. So we have all these. Um, so all these instrument tracks. Um, all right. So if I want to change all these instrument tracks here to. So I'm gonna hold down Alt or Option plus Shift, let's say to chord pads. So it's not activating the quick links, but you know the same keyboard shortcut for quick links, and it's the same concept. Uh, so select your multiple tracks. Okay, I want these all going to my Choice Sauce controller. So this should be chord pads. Below for should be Choice Sauce until the chord pads again. So, um, so just. Alt or Option, so Alt if you're on Windows, Option if you're on Mac, plus Shift, plus uh, Change, and hold that down while you set one of the input ports. Okay, John Costigan is saying, uh, please press the Like button. All right, we see Michael Teams from Weatherford, Texas. And again, you don't have to apologize for being late to the live stream when you're not in school, but. But we're glad you made it and everyone's looking forward to your ice cream distribution, Michael. All right, so we have a question. Um, oops, sorry. All 
Okay, so we see question, uh, is there a way to adjust the velocity for pads in Groove Agent for playing live? All right, so let me just add Groove Agent instance. So I'm not sure if you want to do uh, like a acoustic agent or not, but all right. So let's say we go come over here. We can see. All right, so there is a, if you come, so let's say if you, if you don't want the dynamics of it, you know, we could come over here and just say there's a fixed velocity option. So now it, wherever I click, it's always gonna be at a velocity of 127. So if we turn off the fixed velocity uh, and I go to the snare, we could hear multiple velocity layers. And with the fixed velocity turned on here, we could set the velocity layer that you want. So no matter where you click, it will just play back the same exact velocity. Um, so, but if you wanted to adjust that, so, but, and then, you know, if it's a beat agent kit, at that point you could adjust, you know, the velocity range. So let's say if I want to load a kit, So in an acoustic agent kit, those velocities are not as user adjustable, but if it's kind of more of a beat agent kit, which is kind of more of an uh, MPC paradigm. So when I come here, uh, if you have multi samples, let's see if we have any that are multi samples here. But you could, you know, have multiple, let me see if I could just. I'll just drag some samples over here to show. I'll just open a different project here real quick. Hang on. All right, so let's say if I have, uh, here is what I was looking for, sorry. Okay, so if we wanted to adjust the velocity control, <clears throat> I'll just drag these samples to an instrument pad. 
So now as we could do this, we could see that we can trigger between different velocity levels. And if you wanted to adjust your velocity levels here, you could just graphically drag those. It will automatically split it depending on how many samples you have and divide it, but you could adjust manually there for your velocity setting. So let me know if that makes sense. All right, great to see Samson Strike from Austria on the live stream. Let me see Michael Teams is on his ice cream distribution. All right, so we have Jean-Marie Horvat on the live stream. Welcome, buddy. Hope you're doing well. Glad you can make it today. All right, so we have um, so we have a question. Uh, does the new Spectra Analyzer software update work in Cubase 12 Pro, or is it just a standalone software? So uh, it works either way. So if we have samples that we want it to, uh, you know, work with, uh, you know, we, we could integrate via ARA2. So at this point, if we uh, just come to like our track settings here, we go to our top, we could just add like the spectral layers extension on the track level. Uh, and then, so we could, you know, it could work standalone or when we double click, we could see all of our spectral editing kind of integrated directly inside of Cubase as well. So it works both ways. All right, so we have a question from uh, Best Korean Jesus. Uh, is there a way to have the MIDI logical editor to detect notes with MPE value, pan pitch, and set to the very last 32nd uh, note to be neutral? Uh, I'm not sure what values it will affect, so. All right, so let's say we want to do this. Is, I think we could do some some of the note expression stuff, but we'll check it out. So let's come over here to the logical editor. So I think that there are some presets. So let's look under the note expression. see if we could okay so let's see if we could backward engineer this here um, okay so let's say we're gonna set VST three events Okay. So let's see, we're gonna say we want tuning and then we'll say position
think we could say inside bar range. Okay, so let's see, this might kind of get us there, so let's see if we can. Just check my all right. So that was for the right value now. So So I could play around with this with some more if you want to email me, but I think if we kind of play around with some of this, so let's say I want to create a pan one shot. Let's see if we come over here. Yeah, I could play around with it some more. You might be able to kind of, you know, I might have been close where I was going, but I don't want to spend 40 minutes on it, so. Let's see, Jazz Dude used a... Uh, I think he used the spectral layers one to isolate Kate Bush's voice for running up that hill. So love Kate Bush's stuff. All records are amazing. So All right, uh, so we see, hey Greg, is it possible to zoom into a project by moving up instead of pulling down with the mouse? Thanks. All right, so you just switch projects where it's a little more obvious. So I think if you wanna reverse this, this is zooming, um, all right, so when I go down, it zooms in and up, zooms out. So let's see, it might be, 
Let me just try switching my OS. mouse okay and let's see if I switch my scroll direction at the OS level Now I think it's kind of fixed that way. Um, so if that's what you wanna do, I think that that's gonna be fixed. Sorry about that. I'll just reread it and make sure. Yeah, so I don't know a way to invert that. Okay, so reading through comments. All right, so Michael Teams has granted my family and I one gallon of fresh strawberry ice cream. So thank you, and we'll enjoy it over the weekend. All right, so we have a question. Uh, hey, Greg, my client who comes in wants to pull up sounds quickly, like cowbells or strings. I'm not sure how to do that so fast. Is there a way to do that or how to search for them? So if it's like samples, like, you know, loops or something like that, you could just kind of, let's say you go to loops here and just type in search. And then you could just type in cowbell and or if you're looking for strings you know so here we could have different instrument strings so so we these are different like midi but if you wanted to just listen to like audio samples of strings. And if you're going into like, you know, VST instruments, you can say, okay, I want to go to Halion Sonic SE. And then I could just type in strings. And then just navigate down. You could load up the sound. And then once you like a sound, you can say, oh, this is the sound that they like. Just drag it from the media bay over and it's automatically loaded up directly into the project, just like that. And we could see what instrument it comes from. So. And that's all you have to do, and I'll just set my. And that's all you have to do. So try using the media bay and just, you know, in the little search, just type in what you're looking for, and you could go through, you know, any number of instruments looking for sounds that fast. All right, so just see, uh, we're questioning about like the uh, YouTube com about the live streams being quiet. So sometimes I just want to be careful, so you could see kind of overall my levels. Uh, I could try to boost it a little bit, but sometimes you don't have as much control uh, in the you know post process. So we just try to make sure that we're not clipping as we're doing the live stream. So I'll try to boost it a little bit. 
but sometimes the live streams are different than other YouTube videos with uh, what you're able to transmit and it's not boosted kind of in post-production. See, Michael Pierce is indicating that someone using Studio One that they have all the same exact transport functions as Cubase. So, All right, so I think I might be at the end of live questions. I know we had some other ones that were sent in, so give me a second and I will try to switch over to questions that were sent in. All right, so I just see a question uh, it was just entered. Um, so question earlier you showed uh, to add edit in place in the track itself. I did this, fantastic by the way, but now I open older projects and the settings are not carried over. Um, so that might be, you know, some settings are gonna be determined on a project level as opposed to globally. So that may be just a setting that's in projects. So as you start new projects or you could just simply uh, you know, so I think that that is a project that is a project level setting. All right, so let me jump to some of the questions that were mailed in advance. Thanks for all the great questions. And if you've learned something new, make sure that you hit the like button and subscribe to the channel. All right, so we have, uh, hi, using Cubase Pro 12, I've loaded Halion Sonic in Cubase 12, and for some reason or another, it loads with an instrument sound already loaded. Uh, an instrument will also load when launching Halion Sonic SE standalone. It's all, it is always the same instrument. Uh, not sure how to resolve this. Maybe you know, working with Win 10 PC, any tips would help, and thanks for the live streams. They're great. All right, so when we go to you know, generally start uh, an instrument here. So let's say we go to Halion Sonic SE. So you may notice that we, it may, you know, like if we go to, I think if, I think if I go to Halion, we could show this particular feature. So let's go to our Halion, and this will probably load up with a particular preset like a default preset. I guess mine isn't anymore. So, but if it loads up with, let's say, a default preset in Halion Sonic or Halion, if you click right in this area, so below the logo, right click, uh, and what you could do is just choose to right click here. And if you wanted to open up without a particular sound loaded, you can cut the program right click here and then choose save as default. And then at that point, it will, every time you open up the instrument, that will be the default setting, the default sound that's loaded. So if you don't want any sound, you could just choose that. Okay, another question. Uh, hi, Greg. I've recently discovered the Club Cubase broadcast. Fantastic resource. Uh, the question has been asked before, but was not really answered. Uh, I want to record trigger notes for chord pads and have a MIDI track playback these as input to the pads and then record the chord pad output. Uh, recording from the chord pads results in the notes of the chords, not the triggers. Uh, use case, I improvise a bunch of chord pads as a piano chords. 
uh, either as mouse clicks or keyboard. They sound great, but I can't remember what I did. And I want now to re-trigger with guitar arpeggios on another track. Okay, so let's come over. Let's go to the jump off project here. Activate this. Okay, so we'll go to our chord pads now. All right, so as we go to the chord pads themselves, you know, when we trigger these particular note ranges, let me transpose my controller keyboard. So, you know, when we have this set up to record from, you know, like the chord pads as our input. So let's say I do this and I'm, I'll just solo this and we're gonna record. It will record, you know, the chords. So it is recording the full chord by design. And, but if you need to know what chords you played, if you really loved what was played, really all you have to do is select the event if you wanna do it for other chords. And at this point, go to your project menu and go to chord track and say, create chord events. And now it will automatically lay out the chord events for you in the chord track and other tracks can actually just follow those. So if you don't know what chords you played and instead of having this single trigger note, trigger the chords and output that separately, you could just, you know, select the event, go to the pro go to the project menu and then on the chord track just say create chord events when that for from the selected event and then it'll tell you what chords you played. And then you could use as the basis for the chord track for other instruments. Okay, we got that one already. All right, let me switch projects for this next question. All right, uh, so this question is, um, uh, when question, when muting slash unmuting a group track, it also mutes slash unmutes the tracks that are sent to this group. I want the mute to be only on a group track and not, uh, not all group tracks. For example, I have four vocal tracks grouped together, two of them are muted. Uh, now I'm working on a guitar, so I mute the vocal group track and I want to unmute it. It unmutes all the four vocal tracks, but I want it to unmute the group vocal track and keep the two vocal out of the four still muted. Okay, so I think, let's go ahead and take a look. Let's say I want to take all my drums and we will put these, we'll add a group channel to these. Okay. All right, so we look at our group channel and let's say I have a couple of tracks muted and then I mute the group channel and we can see that all of them will become muted and they're kind of linked based upon what the status is. And when I unmute, the other ones are, are all kind of globally unmuted. So I think if we go to our Cubase to preferences, um, we could take a look at under VST, I think. 
Uh, and we see his preference. I think this might do it. So group channel mute sources as well. So I'm going to uncheck that preference. So I have these three unmuted. I mute the group track and then these mutes will be independent of the group track. So as we're playing, let's say, I wanted to have the kick and snares all muted. Okay, as we're playing. Then it'll say if I mute the drum group, and then when I unmute, so now everything is muted when I unmute the other tracks will play and be unmuted. So this way the mute won't globally uh, mute the track. So again, go to your Cubase, to preferences, to VST and uncheck uh, group channels, uh, mute sources as well. All right, let's come over back to the live stream questions. Again, thanks for all the great questions that people have had. We're doing pretty well on time. All right. Okay, reading through different comments. Okay, so I just see from Spike Williams. Uh, hey, Greg, I just tried searching for Cowbell in Media, in Media Bay, and nothing shows. I tried suggestions to move files to desktop, but no joy. So when you do this uh, in the Media Bay, you know, we get, so when I come over here, you know, make sure, and you could often see this in, if you're in the Media Bay here, you know, make sure that you don't have a particular folder selected. So if we go to this computer and I say, okay, let's look for Cal and I'm looking for, you know, audio files, you know, so you may have different filter conditions. So I just, you know, selected VST sound and then, you know, just type in cowbell like, or cow. And this will show, but sometimes you may have all of different filters. So, you know, like I, I'll see sometimes people have sound effects, other, you know, Bavarian one shot, you know, disco death metal set as filters. So maybe make sure that you don't have any filters set and that, you know, you're just kind of looking. So if you click on VST sound, you should definitely see some different ones. Or if you wanted to look in particular folders. Um, let me just scan this folder here quickly. So I'll just rescan this disk. It may take just a little bit, but now as we want to uh, just come through here, we can now search for all the things in the media bay here will be accessible for you. All right, reading through comments. All right, we see Gerald Ely has to take off for the weekend and just thanking me for the, all the work we do. So you're welcome. Glad it's helpful. All right, 
you see John Costigan in the spirit of virtual giveaways of soup or ice cream is giving away virtual air conditioning. Very clever. So he's sending 15 degrees of virtual air conditioning, I believe, to Michael Teams. So I think he'll probably want that in Celsius. Okay, so we have a question. Uh, when mixing, is there a difference between using the groups versus using VCAs? So yeah, when we work with VCAs, uh, let's say for instance, in this example, I'll just open up a project, show this. So the first main difference is that VCAs don't actually sum. They don't kind of collect all the different sounds uh, when they work. All right, so let me just. All right, so we'll go to our <clears throat> mix console here. I'll just make all right so let's say I have a lot of existing automation already and let's say on my snare I'm going to add like an effect send so I think let's see if we have one already all right so let's say we'll add this uh, more obvious plate. So let's say we have uh, a mix with way too much reverb on the drums for demonstration purposes. All right, so I'll just bring it down maybe. All right, so when we group elements together, you know, we sum all of the different, all the different channels will be summed and we could often use groups for when we want to take all of our drums and do parallel processing or do like take all of our background vocals, put it into a group and put a compressor where we could process kind of the collective entity of all of the sounds. So we're able to do that with a group. Now VCA is different in that it doesn't actually collect or sum the audio. And VCAs are often used when there's more extensive existing automation. So let's look at our drums here. And as we look at the drums, we can see that we have some of these faders that are going up and down. So I'm going to select all my drum tracks here. And let's assign them to a group. assign these particular, sorry about that. Okay, so we'll add a group channel to the selected. All 
All right, so now I could bring down. All right, but now you hear that like my reverb when I bring this up or down my reverb on the snare, you can still hear the reverb. But and once again, if I have a lot of automation, when we want to add a VCA, when I want to select all of my different drums here, and we're gonna add a VCA fader to these particular tracks. Okay, so once we do this, we have our green fader. So. And I orphaned the routing on all these tracks, so bear with me just for a second. I can send these all back to the stereo out. Just revert real quick here. All right, so now when we have automation, like we see the automation going on in the particular channels. And so I'll just. So we see in our drums that we had the faders going up and down. So what a VCA is going to allow us to do is to take all of the drums and regardless of if the if I move the, if I want to increase or decrease the volume I can move my VCA down and tracks that were going up we can see that their faders are being kind of attenuated but as I move my VCA fader up the tracks that we're automating down will still automate downward so I'm going to automate my VCA. So I will now just do automation. So now when we go to the automation itself, um, we'll see that we're gonna have kind of two levels of automation as we zoom in here. So one is the actual automation of the track and one is the change of the VCA. So, so and the VCA is kind of attenuating, either bringing it down or maybe raising it up. And at this point, we could just say uh, we want to kind of coalesce the automation, the automation between the two of them. Now, as I bring down my, let's say we have our snare reverb that we're listening to earlier. And let's just go ahead and we'll go to our sends and I want to All right, so when we have a group, we could hear the, you know, we will hear the difference, but as I bring and attenuate the level of the VCA on the snare, it doesn't affect the gain structure going to the actual effect return. So a lot of times people will have drums, they put it into a group, they adjust the group down and it affects all of the effect sends on all the tracks. And that can significantly change the tone of the mix, whereas a VCA will maintain that relationship between the effect sends and not make that change. So VCAs are, are better for if you have existing automation and maybe the automation's going in contrary motions that will be be handled you know, very well utilizing a VCA fader and if you have a lot of effects ends. 
And if you have, if you wanted to create like parallel processing, you could use a group to do that. And you can use a group and a VCA on selected channels for different purposes at the same time. So let me know if that makes sense. Right, just going through different comments. Thanks for all the great questions. And if you learn something new, make sure you do hit the like button. All right, we see Sable Winters is on the live stream. She's number 90 for hitting the likes. Thanks for joining us. Uh, so we see question, does Spectral Layers 9 work in Cubase Pro 12? So it'll work via a ARA2. So yes, it does. Um, so all you have to do is we could select uh, the particular event. We could go to audio to extensions and add Spectral Layers there. We could select the event and we could choose extensions here or if we wanted to do it on a track level. So now we could just do it on the track level and as I double click, we could see everything in the spectral layers here. So it's no problem. So yeah, and you get a spectral layers one uh, with Cubase 12. And then uh, there's also Spectral Layers Elements and Spectral Layers Pro, which is pretty amazing software. All right, so we see, uh, how do I unpack stems in Spectral Layers 12? All right, so there's a Cubase, uh, Cubase 12 and Spectral Layers 9 are the latest versions. So I'll just do maybe a new project here. I'll just try this track randomly here. So let's say we will just kind of listen to like a whole mix. Let me tell you lies about myself. Tell me if you're ready. So if we wanted to split this, so Spectral Layers 1, it comes with Cubase 12, we could isolate the vocals and then we get more options with the full version. So I'll come over here, we'll go to Spectral Layers. And now we'll double click uh, and we'll go to Layer and we'll choose to Unmix Stems. So let's say, okay, we wanna do vocals, we'll just kinda do the default here, hit okay. So basically what this is doing, we get, I often make the analogy of it's like taking the eggs out of the cake after it's been baked. Never tried it on this file before. All 
All right, so now that we have, it's basically taken our different elements here. So let's say as we play. What is outside in the cold? I walk alone to my own so we'll go ahead and mute the vocals. You need the drums. Tell me if you're or the bass. What is outside in the cold? I walk alone to my own beat. And when we meet, let me tell you lies about. And if I wanted to just kind of take uh, a, one of the layers and drag it into the timeline. Let me take. Then so that's how you could do unmixing of stems using spectral layers. Pretty scary. All right, so Nexus wants everyone to please hit the like button. So I'm gonna watch hit the space bar. All right, we see Nick has made it into the live stream. Thanks for joining us. All right, so we see, uh, is there a way to uh, make the track height change with a shortcut? All right, so. Don't know of one off the top of my head, but let's take a look. I think there might be like a zoom on tracks. So you could do a uh, command. So like on a selected track, I'll just jump back to. This one. So say I have these, so I'm just hitting control uh, command or command or control plus the up and down arrows just to do that. So give that a shot. Okay, so we see a question from Jay. Uh, it says, uh, if you'd be so kind as to indulge another question, just ask any questions you want. Um, I'd appreciate it. Uh, so question, I guess, is when adding free warp markers, little numbers appear beneath and change when moved, please explain. Okay, so let's look at, make this kind of large and obnoxious. Okay, um, so a little number appears beneath and change when moved. So what this is indicating is the position. So let's say I'm in measure 12 here. So we see measure 12, beat one, or measure 18, beat one, 
And so th at this point, we could just see uh, like the actual time position. And I think if we switch this to seconds, we'd see that what we went as we do this, it would indicate the seconds as well. So if you wanted to see the uh, the numbers just to the right of the tool in bars and beats and seconds. So those are just kind of showing you those particular values in time. Cause sometimes you may say, oh, I need this to be at exactly 10 seconds, or I need this to be right at measure 18. So we could just see the different time values as you uh, move the cursor with the tool active. All right, so we have a question. Uh, does Cubase have a plugin that reduces sample quality and bit depth uh, for interesting effects? All right, so let's come over here. I'll just put it on the base. So I think it's a bit crusher. So I'll just come here. So under distortion, go to the bit crusher. Have different modes. All sorts of fun stuff you could do with that for creative, interesting effects. So yeah, check out under distortion, you'll find a Bit Crusher plugin. And Jazz Dude's also mentioning the Destroyer plugin. That's also another one. All right, so we see Stella, Mark Raven's dog is with her, I guess in Denver, so. All right, so we see Sorn has been able to return from the concert to make the live stream. So glad I lasted longer than a concert, all right. So thanks for joining us and glad you can make it. Now you have to make sure you, you hit the like button if you haven't done it already. All right, we see that Graham Witcher is late because he was so inspired and had to capture it in Cubase. So we'll, we'll give that as a valid excuse. All right. All right, Nick Padgett is saying he's never been acknowledged in a live stream before. He feels honored. So you're welcome. And thanks for, I'm, I'm honored that you attended the live stream. Thanks for being here. All right, so we have uh, Steve from Manchester. Great to see you. Um, All right, uh, so we see uh, in spectral layers, I can isolate a vocal. The singer had an overdrive on his vocal. Is there a way of reducing the overdrive to make the vocals clearer? So once you're in spectral layers, um, you know, there's once you have the audio file out, um, you could, let's just come over here, but there is a, there's some functions in spectral layers which may help. So check out if you go, come over, it might be under processes, um, like a clip repair. Um, you know, check this out, uh, the clip repair. So if there's like distortion where it's clipping the audio, you can kind of isolate it. 
uh, and adjust the threshold here. So I would definitely kind of play with the clip repair because that could fix kind of distortion and overdrive effects uh, and see where that gets you. But I would definitely try that. Okay, so I see maybe a further clarification from Jay uh, about the warp markers. He says, sorry, I mean the number of the slices. So let's take a look at it. Let's go back to our free warp tool. So if, if it's this number here, this might be just showing like what the stretch factor is of, of what's being applied in the warp. So it looks like half the distance there is about 50%. So that might be just the factor of the stretching so if it's the upper number right here, I think that's the factor of how much stretching is being utilized. Just my chat field just jumped on me. Okay, so I see a uh, question. How do you shorten sustain of audio in the uh, audio editor? All right, so let me just... Just do a new project here. Just create kind of a pad sound. Okay, so let's say we have that and I will set it to go a little longer and I'll just render this as an audio file. So let's just go to Okay, so let's say we'll look at this in the sample editor. Um, So, you know, what you might do is just kind of take even just like a portion of it. And let's say here we want to get to the process and You know, at this point, we could just say, okay, I want it to have a sharper fade out. And then from this point on, I want it to, uh, we go to basic commands and we could insert silence. So now as we listen to it. As opposed to where we were. So, you know, check out some of the, once you have it in there, check out some of the functions under the process um, and see if that's helpful.
appreciate all the uh, moderation from Jazz Dude. Thank you. All right, so we have Heinz just saying hello and thanks. So thanks for being a part of the live stream. All right, uh, we have a question. Uh, hey, Greg, every time I go to the audio mix down window, I have to reset it because I can't see the OK button. Is there any way to have that come up in a fixed size on my monitor? So, you know, make sure, you know, some of the windows you may, you know, depending on your screen resolution, I find a Cubase. I personally really like Cubase at a 1920 by 1080 resolution, which is what you see on my screen. But when we go to the export audio window, um, you know, there are some things that, you know, if you see the export queue, sometimes if, you know, if the screen is taking, you know, too much space, you can come over here and try closing uh, the export queue. And I think if you just kind of grab, you know, the bottom handle here, uh, you, you can resize to just see that and try you know moving it up you know grab you know, and if you don't see that try grabbing the upper right hand corner and moving it all the way over and then you could probably expand to show more of that but if you have like so if i have this down and i open the export queue you can see that it gets larger uh when doing that so if you try closing some of the different tabs, you could do that. But sometimes I know like some MacBook Airs may be like a really small resolution, like 1378 by 768 or, you know, 1376 by 768, a really kind of small resolution where you can't see a lot on your screen. So if you have the option to change the resolution on your screen, that would be, you know, great because you're probably missing on a lot of great uh, features. Okay, uh, so we have a question, how to find a high DPI? So, you know, if you are if you have a high DPI monitor and your video card is capable of it, uh, you could enable it. Uh, on the Mac platform, it's kind of automatically enabled via the, you know, Retina support that's been added a number of years ago. On the Windows platform, what you do is go to your preferences and under general, you will see a function for enable high DPI, and then you'll have high DPI scaling. So you could just, you'll see functions right there. It's not in the Mac version, but it's in the Windows version. So you could turn it on and off there. All right, so we have a question. Uh, does Cubase have an envelope follower that could be mapped to certain parameters? So one of the things that you could do is uh, just check out the you know one of the new plugins that was included. I would check out the FX modulator. So you'll see it under modulation, and we'll come right over to the FX modulator. And here we could set kind of different, you could have up to six different modules. So you could say, okay, I wanted this to do, you know, volume. And I wanted this particular envelope. I wanted it to be, you know, synced to tempo. I wanted it to be 30 second notes, half notes, or 16 measures, and be able to have different envelopes that you could just create and do different things like that. So, you know, there's, a number of different effects that you could use here uh, within the FX modulator, and that was introduced in Cubase 12. All 
All right, so we have Oscar just says, uh, welcome from Barcelona, Spain. Thanks for being a part of the live stream today. Been to Spain a number of times, never made it to Barcelona. I've been many years, but got to go to Gandia when I was in high school south of Valencia. All right, so Oscar is just saying he's new to the channel. He has Cubase 5 with the license, but his Mac does not allow him to put more modern versions of a Steinberg MR816 CSX. Uh, yeah, that's a wonderful interface. I still use mine. Yeah, sometimes uh, it can be tricky with older Mac operating systems and compatibility. But when you get a new computer, know that you'll have a Cubase there ready for you. All right, so we see Marco Crop is saying, hey, Greg, hey, Jazz, dude, what a great experience I've been having with Cubase 12. You and Dom Sigalis have helped a lot, so thanks, and we're glad that you're happy using your Cubase. All right, and uh, Marco has a question. Um, so is there a way to set quick control defaults per instrument? Uh, right now I have to use instrument preset, so let's go ahead and... Just load an instrument quickly. All right, so as soon as we come uh, in, and this was this behavior was kind of uh, enhanced in version 12. So we'll see this little QC icon in the particular instrument. So usually the first eight parameters of the instrument that have been chosen, you know, for the automation by the developer are selected. But we may want to do different parameters. So we could click on this little learn function. So we and we access this atop of the window. So we'll just click on learn and say, okay, I want this parameter for quick control one. When I click on quick control two, I want it to be this parameter. When I go to quick control three, I want it to be this parameter. So now when I adjust my quick controls, we'll take out a learn mode. It'll just be adjusting the parameters that we have assigned by default. So you could just simply um, assign all of those. And next time you open up the instrument, those will be the default quick control assignments. All right, just read through more comments. All right, so we have a question. Um, hey, Greg, uh, question. Uh, with the built-in gate compressors and channel strip uh, and EQ, are those considered plugins and do they take up resources? So you could consider them plugins. They are processing the audio. They do take up some system resources, like every processor is gonna take a little bit of CPU to do its math and number crunching and thinking. Uh, but usually the built-in ones, I think you'll find them to be very efficient in comparison to other third-party tools. So, you know, a lot of people can run a lot of those without, you know, more than other third-party solutions, so. Okay, so we see with Marco, just a clarification on the quick controls. 
He says, uh, that QC I use a lot, but I meant in the inspector tab, uh, the quick controls, I use one controller, but the inspector quick controls I use uh, with another. Um, all right, so let's say I have, uh, well, I'll go to my MIDI remote here. And I have uh, two different ones, so let me switch this. I'll just go ahead and open up. All right, so let's say I have this set up to do my Troy Sauce controller to do quick controls. And I also have like this knob to do quick controls. All right. Okay, and if you want it to take, like let's say I have um, like even different quick, you know, one of the things that you could do with the, with the particular quick controls is, you know, if you want it to have one controller do maybe some quick controls here and, you know, this particular, so let me open up the instrument one of the other things that you could do that a lot of people miss is let's say I'm not doing the learn for the quick controls, but I wanted to uh, reassign to different patterns. So let's say I'll come here, we'll open up, let's say my, and I'll go to my MIDI mapping. So I move this parameter and now if I right click, a lot of them we could just pick up for um, pick up for MIDI remote mapping. So if I want it to just control a particular parameter that was, you know, just on this. So let's say, okay, I want fader two here. And I want it to control this parameter. So we'll pick up for MIDI remote mapping. And then I could apply the mapping, just this, uh, and have that independent of the quick controls. But you could also lock um, particular quick controls to an instrument. So while we're here, we could just say, I only want to control uh, retro log with this quick controls, but I want the other, like my Korg Nano control, to do quick controls for different functions, but my uh, when I do my quick con my controls here, I'm controlling different parameters in the plugin. So if you wanted to lock a particular controller for quick controls for an instrument, you could do that and have another eight quick controls available for you. Okay, so we have a question um, from Jan from Denmark. Uh, how can I see bar in pool and time in the panel? Um, so let's say if we, let me just go to a different project here. All right, and let's say I go to my pool window under media. So if, all right, so if we want to see like our different parameters, I'll try not to close it this time. All right, so we could view different attributes here. So I'm not sure if bar is like, you know, like the signature or, and the time. So if you have a, like the timestamp, so, and it could be that you could, 
maybe just drag these out. I'm not sure if I'm misunderstanding the question, but we can see kind of your signature, key, timestamp, kind of all the different information here, but make sure that you have it visible in the view attributes and you could always just do uh, show all. So let me know if, but if I'm misunderstanding. All right, so you see a question from Nick, uh, just saying unmixed uh, about spectral layers, uh, unmixed stems, drag and drop stems, bounce next to decouple from spectral layers. I think you could do that, or from the inspector area, you could just choose to uh, make all permanent. So if you come here uh, under the extensions, uh, at that point, you could, once you have the extension loaded, you can make track extensions permanent. And I think that will decouple it so that it could play back and it'll be rendered as a separate audio file. All right, so Sable Winters is just telling people, don't forget to hit the thumbs up. All right, so we see a question uh, from Kevin Mehmed. Uh, when you save a WAV file previously in Cubase Pro, can you go and edit it in Cubase 12? So yes, definitely. So any project or WAV file that was done in other, uh, other versions of Cubase, earlier versions, you, you could definitely open in and be able to edit it quickly and easily. Okay, so he said, uh, just see, can you show me how to do separate a wave file and separate the individual tracks? Um, so we did it just a couple minutes ago, but all you'd have to do is in spectral layers. Um, I won't go through the process again. We just did it about five, 10 minutes ago. Uh, but I'll just take this particular area. transfer it over to spectral layers. And then when you go to layers menu within spectral layers, Uh, but within spectral layers, all you'd have to do then is go to layers and choose unmixed stems. All right, uh, so we see a question. Hello, Greg. I've noticed uh, an audio mix down window when I'm trying to insert ID3 tag. You can only do it for MP3, but not WAV files. Is there a way to insert the ID3 tags uh, in WAV full uh, streaming? So I believe that it's part of the MP3 specification, but not necessarily a standard for WAV files, which is why you kind of see the distinction with that. All right, so we see uh, from Best Screen Jesus, just nice comments. As always, learn so much from every stream. Thank you, Greg. So you're welcome, and thanks for being a part of the live stream and asking such great questions. All right, uh, so we have a question. Hey, Greg, uh, I'm trying to find a way to make some of my audio tracks black, but I don't see the color palette for it. Is there a way to do that? All 
All right, so let me just switch to a different project. Okay, so let's say if we want black events as a color, we'll come over to our project color setup. And let me just take this particular color. So let's come over here and let's assign. So you could have it black and then if you want the waveforms to be white, you could probably come over here. And let's go to event appearance, audio and do waveform brightness. So if you wanted black parts with a waveform that you could see and have it be white, you could set it up like that. So let me know if that is helpful. Okay, uh, we have a question. Uh, is there a way to say presets for inserts in the control room? Right, so let me just I don't may load up a track preset. So let's see if we could drag a track preset over. No. Yeah, I don't think so because generally I think most people would leave the control room um, to be the same. So, I, so yeah, I don't I don't know of a way I could I could play around with it, but I thought maybe we might be able to trick it with a track preset, but it doesn't look like that works. All right, so how to see bar and time in the transport. So sorry for misunderstanding. All right, so when we see our transport in our time window, we could see generally one uh, transport time format. Now, if we wanted to see two, we'll see these three little dots just to the right of the transport. So I'm just going to extend that over. And now I could see my bars and beats and seconds. So if we abbreviate those settings or elongate them, we could see one or two different uh, time values. So we could see bars and beats and seconds at the same time. All right. So we just see. Um, Jason Gomel says, Greg, uh, hope one day Pro Tools users take the jump over to Cubase because they're missing so much with everything that's going on with Avid. So 
you've had a lot of people switch from, you know, switch to Cubase from many different programs. So it's great. So we like having perpetual licenses. All right. So we see Michael Pierce has to dash. Thanks for joining us, Michael. We'll see you on Tuesday, hopefully. Have a wonderful weekend. All right, so we're just about out of time. I want to thank everyone for, um, all right, let's just, okay, I see just a quick question, Marcos Gomez, uh, between your uh, 816C RT4, RT4 to your 816 because of the Rupert Neve transformers. I think the Rupert Neve transformers are really spectacular on it. Uh, so, but if you're doing microphones and recording, you know, like instruments, uh, it sounds great, but it may not have as much of an impact on the way out. So if you're just mixing with it, then, you know, you might have more, uh, flexibility with the, uh, UR816 because of the number of ins and outs, but great to see you on the live stream, Marcos. Uh, with that, we're going to go ahead and wrap up. We're just about at four hours. I want to thank everyone for all the great questions, and we'll see everyone. We'll start at the same time on uh, Tuesday at 1 p.m. U.S. Eastern. And uh, everyone, please stay safe and healthy over the weekend, and we will see everyone on Tuesday. Thank you very much. Goodbye.